So I'd like to welcome everyone to the second session for our second public workshop. We had a terrific conversation from one till about 2.30. We're really looking forward to this afternoon's conversation. Uh, we're here to talk about the next round of thinking on downtown Markdale's community visioning exercise. My name is Donna Hind. I'm a partner at the Planning Partnership and on the call is one of my business partners, Wai Yin to Giorgio, she's gonna wave her hand. And together we're gonna to walk you through uh, the evolution of the work that you saw and maybe read about in the online survey that was back from me. I'm gonna ask everyone to mute themselves. And if you're calling in, you can mute your phone just so we don't get any background. Uh, so there we go, just make sure everybody, and so just keep an eye on that if you're moving around um, and you have become unmuted. Also on the call are a couple of people from our uh, steering committee. Maybe I'll just get Elizabeth and David to put and wave your hands. Elizabeth and David Sisom, you can just wave, who have a property just outside of Markdale. And also on our committee is Jim Harold, as well as, and I don't think Jim's on the call, as well as we have a, a great um, representatives from the municipality. So we've been working hard with our steering committee. We really value the opinion that they bring to the work that we've done because they have extensive professional background in urban design and architecture and urban geography. And so it's really been a great contribution to the, to the thinking. So thank you, Elizabeth and David. So here we go. We will um, start with telling you a little bit about our work program. And I am gonna stop a couple of times during the presentation. The last session I waited to the end I'm going to make a couple of pauses along the way. So our work program, we're working within three phases and we're here in the third phase where we're, we're presenting an emerging uh, idea, emerging vision. We're right here at the preferred plan here on July the 6th. And we're aiming to go to council with a presentation summarizing everything we've heard on July the 21st. And we follow very quickly with a, a report that I'll come back to at the end. We're focusing on the municipally owned properties that there are these properties outlined in red on your screen. Toronto Street right down the middle of the air photo and Main Street across uh, on the east-west axis. These are the two properties that we're focusing on, but you're gonna, going to see some of the work we've dipped our toes beyond the red boundaries and we'll share some ideas. So those red properties and municipally owned properties we're showing you now within the context of all of Markdale. Yellow circles is a five minute walk to the intersection, a 10 minute or so walk to the intersection. So all of Markdale with, is within easy walking distance. And within the outer circle, you'll see an overlay of the uh, uh, the residential development plan that's just south of the school that has new uh, single detached housing largely, the municipal building down at the bottom of the image, the future hospital site, grocery Tim Hortons down here at the south end just to get you oriented Mark or Chapman's up at the north west corner of the, the air photo. When we met in May, we showed a bunch of, of um, maps that we wanted to share some observations about existing conditions. And one of those existing conditions was the location of municipal parks and other open spaces. And this is really important because in the plan that Wai Ying is gonna walk you through, we try really hard to make connections to some of those important public spaces like the school, King Edward Park, the arena. We also looked at the locations of all private and public parking that was off street and on street. And we come to a tally of around 130 spaces. We're gonna share um, a snapshot of some of the results from the parking survey that the municipality has completed. So you can see lots of options for parking in and around the sites that we're focusing on. Historic buildings, buildings that are designated or buildings that have been identified as having heritage value. So quite an inventory of buildings with heritage character in and around our site. 
So what we've done so far, we had one workshop in May, we had two sessions, we had about 60 people join, both of them. And I've got to say, in my experience over the last 16 months, we are having terrific, um, terrific input through the online forums and terrific attendance. And I've been in my career spanning many decades now, I've been at too many meetings where I've opened public sessions where five people have showed up. So now the online forums give people a chance. They don't have to arrange for babysitting. It's not weather dependent. And it really has opened up the opportunity for people to join from wherever they want. We also did the online survey. I'm going to share you uh, share with you the results. 315 people uh, participated in that survey. I've never had a public meeting where I've had 315 people come. So the input that we're getting is really important and valuable and really contributing to what we're exploring. From that survey, we found out that 35% of the respondents were over 50, but 63%, just going to make sure everybody has their mics on, 63% were between 20 and 50, which is fantastic because it tells us that we're getting a spectrum of um, people responding with ideas. 83% were full-time year-round residents. 26% uh, live in Markdale. 56 live within 10-minute drive. 75% of the respondents come to Markdale to visit a business. And over 50% are coming to Markdale at least a couple of times a week. So that's really great um, insight for us. The municipality um, did a great job distributing these posters on the side of the screen around town to make sure that people were directed to the survey. Um, are you hearing music in the background, Wayne? Can you hear the music? No. Um, I'm hearing it, but I was muted, so it's not me. No, I, I'm thinking it's me. Sorry, I'm going to close this here. Okay. Um, at the last workshop, the May workshop, we asked a couple of questions and I wanted to share the responses that we got, the summary of what we heard. We asked from your perspective, what are the ingredients of a successful, healthy, thriving town center? We asked people to give us ex some examples and the in gold bar on the side are the communities that people on the calls said were great examples of thriving um, successful, healthy communities. It may not be ones that you share that opinion, but they are what people shared with us. We asked people what the ingredients were. And then down the, the list on the left is, is just a snapshot of all the great ideas people said. Interactive public art, trees and green space, community space, a, a stage, having a destination, having experiences. We really got a full spectrum of ingredients from people. Then we said, tell us the single biggest opportunity for change and the single biggest obstacle for change. So down the left under the positive sign are the opportunities, housing, housing, housing. I can't emphasize enough how many times people have said housing is required. And that is even within the context of knowing the big residential development that's being, that's planned and under construction south of the high school or south of the school, Beavercrest School. So even within that context of that type of housing, people are saying a broader range of housing, more options for housing, more affordable housing. People that move the library downtown, again, have trees and green space. Um, give us a new location for the Pennywise shop. Think about art in the landscape. So lots of ideas. The favorite one that I pointed out in the previous session was the biggest opportunity right at the bottom of the page, people who want change, the biggest obstacle to change people who don't want change. And I thought that was a really insightful comment that was made by one of the workshop participants. Then we showed the concept of May 6th, the, where it was at that stage and had lots of comments about it. I've summarized them on the left side of the page, avoid solid walls, um, think of other locations for the beer store, uh, can the civic square be moved to the west? So I wanted to have a summary of all of that. Uh, in the gold was, was some of Wying's responses to some of the comments and Wying's gonna walk you through a really careful explanation of how we got to where we got. In terms of the survey, we asked uh, for some indication of support for the three plans. The first plan was the framework plan, the overall framework plan, plan. Wying's going to remind everybody what that was. 
92% of the survey respondents gave it three star stars or more. We asked for the um, focused in plan of just the municipally owned properties, 79% of the respondents gave that three stars or more. And then the one that looked just a bit beyond the municipal uh, properties, but not the full Markdale, and 80% of the respondents gave that plan three stars or more. We asked people what is needed to revitalize Markdale. We gave a menu, a list of eight different things, and the three that were the highest ranked was mix of shops and services, more housing options, and getting more people living downtown. So that just reiterates how often we're hearing more housing, more housing. Then we, in the survey, we gave um, images, snapshots from the content of the workshop summary from, or the workshop presentation from May. We wanted to get an indication of broader community support or lack of support. We had a simple question, thumbs up, thumbs down. Do you agree with this general direction? So things like framing the street, top left corner, almost 70%. Variety of housing, 67%. I'm giving you the thumbs up. Streetscaping, almost 80%. Framing public space with buildings and uses and eyes on the space, 84%. Having a village square, 87% agreed with that. Changing the look and feel of Toronto Street. And I will get Wayne when she presents this to talk about some other communities we've worked in that have that that caliber of road through them and what they're doing. Having active ground floor uses, 94%. Having a downtown focus, 90%. Improving wayfinding and signage, 73 cents a place year round. Pedestrian friendly streets and, and having more on street parking. So when we squinted our eyes and looked at that whole page of responses, we're taking that we're generally in the right direction of the work that we're doing. As some of you may know, the town did parking surveys of the centers in Gray Highlands. And for the Markdale one, we pulled out some of the responses to give you a snapshot, 88 respondents. 88% um, of those respondents said they find parking within acceptable walking distance. They rarely have, 44% rarely have difficulty finding on street parking. Most difficult to find parking on weekends, not a surprise. A most find parking, easy to find. Most have been able to find parking in order to support a business. But then in the end, when you ask the question, is there enough parking and is it well signed? No, most feel that it is not. And then we also were happy to see the Facebook group that's been set up. I think there are 111, um, uh, I don't even know what the word is, what's the word, participants in the Facebook group. And we were interested to, to squint our eyes and look at some of the ideas that were put out there and saw many commonalities in the approach to the site. And that's the location of the buildings, framing the public open space, having public open space that has frontage on Highway 10, having building facades that are really well articulated with windows and doors so that there's lots of eyes and activity on the space and on the street. And lots of ideas about how to, how to um, inhabit the open space with tables and chairs and benches and clocks and lighting and all things that will become part of a much more detailed planning exercise for the park. I'm just gonna pause for a minute. I've gone through the work program. I've gone through the context. I've gone through the summary of what we've heard so far. Is there any questions of clarification before I keep going and get into the content, the new content that we're gonna to share today? Just wanna take a pause. I'll just watch for any microphones coming on and I'm not seeing anything. And I'll also point out that you're welcome to use the um, reactions button. Probably it's in the more where there's three dots on your toolbar, there's reactions and you could use the raise hand function. Well, Chris and Roy have their microphones on. I don't know if they wanna say something or they just forgot to turn it off. Um, Thanks, Roy Ying. Yep, go ahead, off. Roy. It's Roy, I, yeah. I'd like to make a comment. Yep. Um, I understand, you know, this visioning is focused on the 
municipal properties. Yeah. Yeah, near the corner. Yes. Uh, of center of town. But when you look at the, um, I guess it was the first slide which showed the uh, five minute and 10 minute walking distances. Yeah. Uh, my first reaction when I see that is almost everything is happening north of Main Street. And secondly, um, the, 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 the work that's going on now uh, further south, hospital, recent finishing of the, uh, the mall, etc. cetera. Um, it would seem to me that part of the visioning should, well, they do recognize those, those, those things that have happened. Also, the school is going to be redeveloped. And um, yeah. how are these things going to eventually interconnect? Because presumably, the, the this whole project, if if it happens, mm -hmm. is going to be spread over what 10, 15 years, maybe, yeah. uh, in terms of the development. And it'll depend on who comes in and how fast. Okay. And other parts of the town too. Yeah. Uh, shouldn't be stagnant. Yep, I completely understand your point, Roy. Wai Ying's got a great diagram she's gonna uh, put up on the screen shortly. And it looks at a bigger area. It's an overall framework plan. So let's hold off and let's have a look at that plan and see if that helps answer your question of how things get all stitched together and what some of the opportunities are that we've identified in the much bigger area. Uh, Wai Ying, was there another? Microphone. Um, oh, Chris, Chris. Chris has his mic on. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Well, maybe not. Okay. Okay. And, and then, um, okay, so let's, let me keep going. Uh, I'm going to introduce this and then hand it over to Wai Ying. Um, when we talked in May, we laid the foundation for some of the work that we uh, presented back in May. And we said the foundational principles were, we were striving for a mix of uses and a mix of types of housing. We were striving to have a magnet for people to create a destination and attraction, to make it all walkable, to do what we could to highlight and demonstrate the rural agricultural heritage character of this area, to plan for a beautiful green space, gathering space, and then to make sure development as it's planned and located is done so that it's compatible with the existing uses. This came um, from our own perspectives of, of doing good planning and design. And it was also shaped by what we were hearing uh, through some a few early conversations with a handful of people and then through the, the workshop that we had in May. So with that, I'm going to, Wai Ying, ask you to talk about the framework plan. And Roy, this is the drawing, this is the plan that I was yeah. uh, making reference to. Yeah, so um, Roy, you, you may be familiar with this if you were, I believe you were at the last session. So we presented this diagram in the first workshop sessions. And it was really meant to um, illustrate in part the importance of the downtown as the center of the uh, central core of the community. Um, the other thing that this diagram is trying to do is illustrate where the downtown sits within that broader context, but also in relation to all of the wonderful things and systems that are surrounding the community, like the natural features, like the existing rail trail and its relationship to the, the main crossroads. Um, it's a diagram that sets the sort of broad, high-level physical structure for how, um, as you mentioned, the, the development of the community uh, might, um, might um, sort of pan out. Uh, what it's showing in, to your point about the, the development that's happening to the south of the downtown, so you can, I don't know if you can see on here, but we've underlaid the subdivision plan that's um, next to the um, grocery store to the south. We've underlaid the under construction hospital site behind the municipal building. And we've added, um, I don't know if Donna, you want to point out 
um, the two uh, townhouse development blocks uh, north of Main Street on, in the northeast quadrant. So all of those things that are um, designed, uh, approved, uh, probably in different phases of construction are highlighted in here. And to the extent possible, this framework plan does very much set the tone for how they fit in. So you can see the orange lines in that grid pattern are connecting existing roads and existing stub roads to a future extended grid of, um, you know, whether they're streets or pathways or trails, it's an extended future grid of how people uh, and cars move around and circulate through the community. So that ties all the different pieces together in the orange lines. In addition to that, what we're showing also is highlighted in the green lines, a much stronger special connection where we see that there is merit in making a connection stronger, either through the design, um, the provision of like double sidewalks or wider sidewalks. These are even more important connections as they actually connect um, natural features across the entire community. So there's two levels of connections that we're suggesting as a structuring element for future development. So in the north, you'll see too that where there are um, currently farm, farm fields, vacant lands, if when development of these lands were ever to occur at some point in the future, um, the grid system and those connections uh, to the existing community as well as to the surrounding green space, um, that grid system would be the structuring um, foundation for how those communities would be built out. Um, so we're showing as well, uh, just a, on a last point, the downtown you can clearly see highlighted in the pink. Um, and then the two crossroads highlighted in the dark, bright red lines, Toronto and Main Streets that are bookended by the circles identified as these important gateway locations, the thresholds for how you enter, approach and arrive in the community. And these are special places where we imagine, you know, whether it's the green space or whether it's um, a building or whether it's a landscape or a streetscape or municipal signage, it's the welcoming, it's the welcome mat to the community. So that's, that's essentially the structure. And in conjunction with those six principles that Donna highlighted, it's the structure um, that our, our, our options have been based on. So on this next slide here, um, the, the next couple of slides were, were, are contain the three scenarios that we presented in the first workshop. And I'll just go quickly and highlight um, just sort of the essence of what these are showing you. So we presented the three development scenarios. They were focused primarily on the lands owned by the municipality outlined in red. And, and it's showing uh, different ways to develop the, the parcels with mixed use buildings on both municipal sites and it's showing a essentially a, a new public space on the west side so the west property. This first scenario shows a series of buildings arranged to frame the streets as one of the core principles, as well as framing the new public space. It's showing a slight increase in height in building height to the downtown currently the zoning provisions allow for 11 meters, which is equivalent roughly to two, uh, to two or uh, two to three stories in building height. And, and we're suggesting in this scenario that it was um, increased to four stories. Uh, as with all of the scenarios, uh, this is showing a very strong desire to create these east-west connections in terms of pedestrian walkways and landscaped areas that connect all the way from Isla Street um, right across Toronto Street to the existing King Edward Park on the east side. On the next slide, uh, scenario two is essentially the same as scenario one, except here, uh, what we're showing is the possibility of combining the two corner sites that the municipality owns with um, a combined development on the adjacent properties as well, in order to create a larger development parcels and the opportunity to create um, a more robust landmark building in these sort of key prominent corner locations. And then with this scenario, we were also exploring a suggestion to increase the building heights from four uh, to six stories. Um, the third scenario that we showed was essentially the what if uh, possibility if the downtown were to be built out in the future in total. So the same principles of mixed use buildings, strong pedestrian uh, connections and streets that frame the street, buildings that frame the streets were extended to other downtown sites. 
Uh, and this included what we identified as underutilized sites, uh, sites that contain buildings that were less than um, two, uh, two stories, for instance, uh, sites that were in a form that had uh, a predominance of large areas of surface parking adjacent to the street with buildings behind, uh, and then sites that were known to have um, potential development um, on them. So those are the three scenarios. Um, and then on the next slide, Donna, if you want to move ahead, um, because the last scenario that you looked at, uh, three embodied all of the principles and the full spectrum of uh, development possibilities for the downtown and the municipal sites, we used it as a basis to further explore and refine the six big moves inherent to all of the scenarios. So here, um, on, on the screen, you can see what those moves were, uh, the idea of mix of uses in the downtown, which is for the most part permitted today, even under the current zoning. Um, but the other thing that was um, quite telling in all of our conversations was this big, um, a, 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 the identified importance of having more residents downtown. Uh, lots of support for buildings that frame the street and public spaces, as well as the need to draw people downtown, as well as to animate and activate the spaces, whether they're spaces, streets, um, or connections uh, and walkways. Uh, we talked a little bit about safer pedestrian-oriented streets. We know, we know today that the, the two crossroads, maybe not the two, but the one that goes north-south as a highway condition is... Um, a little daunting in terms of um, human scale and the ability to uh, connect the east and west sides. Uh, we want to make sure as well in the big moves for all of the scenarios and even the one that I'm going to um, walk you through in the next couple of slides that Main Street, um, the Main Street existing storefronts have the opportunity to have uh, more spill out space and better streetscapes uh, in addition to new buildings that create that Main Street. And then lastly, uh, and obviously, you know, with the with the char existing character of the community as it is, and the abundance of green space, the importance of its agricultural, uh, rural heritage, the uh, the I the idea of greening opportunities is um, uh, common to all of all of the scenarios, and something that should be looked at as a priority. So then, on your on the next several slides. Um, I'm gonna look at how these big moves are applied to the emerging preferred vision. Um, and I'll highlight the key features that make up the, um, the concept as well as highlight the things that have changed since the last time we met back in May. So this first diagram highlights um, essentially streets, walkways, connections. Um, in addition to the east-west mid-block connection that we had talked about um, previously, um, um, we're connecting as well uh, an idea for uh, this space. I've, Don, if you can point to it, I don't want to put a number on there. So we're also it's showing good. this idea for Warner on the south side of the Fire and Ice restaurant, uh, formerly the the um, the fire the fire station and tower. Uh, the Woolen Earth would have uh, special paving and landscaping where space would permit um, to make it look and feel less like a driveway and more as a courtyard environment, uh, while still allowing vehicular access to move um, through, through the space. Uh, in addition, if and when uh, the development of the adjacent municipal site occurs at the corner, and if there is the potential to arrange for access from Main Street to the back of this building, the Woolen Earth condition could be transformed into a fully pedestrian and landscape space. So access to the back that would occur from Main Street where it now occurs from Toronto Street. Uh, in addition to these, the diagrams also showing you Toronto Street reimagined uh, with bump outs and lay-by parking. We know that existing lay-by parking does occur on certain parts of um, Toronto Street. Uh, what we want to try to do here is reduce the appearance of the travel lanes, create more space for street trees and landscaping and the greening opportunities that I mentioned. And we would imagine a fully tree-lined, um, more pedestrian, human-scaled street all the way from the south of Main Street to Cavan at the north end. And lastly, uh, the other thing that this is showing is a pedestrian crossing at the mid-block connection uh, that connects from Isla to the park and that goes right across Toronto Street. And here we're really hoping by um, that a combination of bump outs on either side of the street 
uh, along with special pavement markings, not only within the travel portion of the roadway, but uh, as well as above curb where people are walking uh, on the sidewalk uh, and signage, a combination of these things will help to create that um, more direct connection, safer connection, and really bring down the scale of the street as it is today. On the next slide, um, I'm going to look at Main Street. So for these same for these same reasons um, of slowing traffic down, making it more human skilled, a street environment, downtown environment, similar bump outs and pavement treatments are suggested along existing Main Street. Here, um, we know that the existing buildings are loca located in many uh, many locations, very close to the street edge. Um, so we're kind of limited in terms of the amount of space for street trees. However, with the bump outs, and if we can make the bump outs a little bit longer, uh, we would create more space for the trees. And we heard in the previous session um, about, you know, trees and um, blocking signage. We would have to, in this instance, have trees and select trees that would be either a higher branching columnar in form, have more lacy permeable foliage. So there are ways to select tree species um, that would give you that greenery and give you that identity and character along the street without, um, uh, without impacting too much on the signage of those storefronts. Uh, for the existing buildings on Main Street, uh, we're recommending that a set of guidelines would help to really coordinate improvements as they occur. Uh, the guidelines would address fairly typical elements found in um, a community improvement plan. Uh, these things are listed on the right hand side of the slide and I'm not going to go through them in detail, but you can see that it covers everything from design to signage to colors and materials. And it's really important for new development to consider as well uh, when we talk about spill out area for businesses that we consider um, where redevelopment occurs, setbacks um, that might be different from what's there. We know that it's important to maintain a street wall for consistency, uh, but we want to entertain the idea that slight, <laughs> slight increases to building setbacks would um, not be entirely, uh, it wouldn't detract from the street wall significantly, but it would, would, it would provide significant space or uh, additional space to the existing sidewalk to do all those things that we talked about, like furniture and, and uh, trees and, and uh, enhanced streetscaping, as well as what I've put in here, public art. <laughs> um, next slide. The, go through. Yeah, buildings and uses. So in terms of buildings and, and uses, um, we presented scenarios um, that included for mixed use buildings along Toronto and Main Streets. Uh, the mixed use buildings provide the opportunity obviously for non-residential uses in the ground floor um, and they provide the opportunity, opportunity to potentially add to the retail environment of the downtown without taking away from it. So that's the potential is there. Um, however, we do appreciate that the vitality of the existing downtown may be enhanced by other uses as well that may not necessarily be retail commercial. So all of the building, buildings that are shown with a dark red colored base around them can accommodate a variety of different uses. And these are listed on the right hand side. So everything from um, community uses to maker space and artist space. We, we heard about galleries and a welcome center for the downtown as well as um, what we heard a couple of times about the ice cream museum. So those are all things that could fit uh, nicely into those, the bases of all of those buildings and also provide animation and active uses at the street uh, and park level. Um, we heard from the community that having more people living downtown was really important, actually not only important, but essential to the life of downtown. So based on that direction, uh, and based on the, all of the colored buildings that you see on the slide, we did a very high level, quick quantification of what that means in terms of residents. Um, so th this, is, uh, this is all listed on the right-hand side, but I'll let you know how we came about these numbers. So given, so assuming that there is a, um, a range of two to three story buildings of primarily residential uses around the edge of this drawing, and then transitioning to a general four to six story mixed use building format concentrated along Toronto Street and at corners. 
uh, we estimated that this would, this plan, this vision that you see in front of you would generate two to 3,000 square meters of non-residential space. So the whole list of things that I talked about uh, could be accommodated in these two to 3,000 square meters. And then it would also generate approximately 150 to 200 residential units uh, in those brown colored boxes that are all residential, as well as in the orange and darker brown boxes representing buildings above the ground floor of those mixed use buildings. And that was based on a general unit size uh, of about 90 square meters, which um, I think represents a one to two bedroom scenario. Um, with this scenario as well, we didn't forget about parking because we heard a lot about that in the last time we met. So a combination of parking options uh, are recommended as well to go along with this. Uh, we're suggesting that it, that it include at grade parking located generally behind buildings. So they're away from public view, but still accessible on some of the larger sites. Um, we're suggesting that lay-by parking that already exists and on-street parking along all of the streets uh, be located within and expanded to all the areas within that 10-minute walking radius of the center. Uh, we're, say, we're suggesting as well um, that structured parking uh, above and below grade, depending on the size of the development site, uh, access and economic feasibility still be on the table as one of the tools or one of the options uh, to support potential future development. And then of course, the last thing that we looked at as well was that there are existing parking uh, sites within the downtown uh, King Edward Park, uh, as an example, where if it were to be re-evaluated, redesigned, perhaps there could be some uh, parking or more efficiency gained uh, from sort of a rearrangement of the parking on those existing on those existing sites. So there's four places where we would rely upon as a combination of um, parking options to support that scenario. Oh, sorry. Oh, That's okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I want to go to this one. There you go. Yeah, so this, uh, this slide is showing you uh, uh, some examples of what these buildings could let, look like ranging from the four to six story form with active uses at grade, opening out, spilling onto streets with glass windows, shop fronts, doors, front doors. And then of course, uh, the example showing how it would be, um, how these buildings could really help to animate and frame an urban, a new urban square. This one's, uh, okay. So with this scenario, I think there's some development considerations uh, that need to be uh, brought up and did was brought up in uh, some of our earlier sessions of the workshop. So key considerations to think about. So the existing zoning, as I mentioned, already allows for buildings that are 11 meters tall. And so I mentioned that this allows for or accommodates uh, two stories with pitched roofs or three story buildings with flat roofs. Uh, the question then is, given this existing zoning context, how much development has occurred in the downtown in recent years? I think I know what the answer is. So that leads to, to this purpose of the visioning exercise is to set really a, a guiding framework for the development or redevelopment of the downtown that will revitalize public uh, and private properties. And it's within this context that we need to think about how to position the downtown and the municipal sites to spur, to spur interest and, um, and redevelopment. So the municipality owns properties um, uh, as, as indicated in, those, um, in the red lines. Um, and these properties really do offer the opportunity, the, a tremendous opportunity to catalyze this change while also achieving broader community objectives of um, creating better, uh, better public spaces and better streets. For instance, the streetscapes that we're showing here, as well as this new urban square. I also want to remind everyone on the call here uh, that the renderings we are presenting are not architectural drawings. So although we're showing boxes of buildings, they are general, um, they're general illustrations of massing and arrangement within the downtown at a very high level. Um, they're, and they're also meant to demonstrate key principles, objectives, and structured elements. So while we have heard um, as well that the preference is uh, the preference or the tolerance for buildings within the downtown is around six stories, 
And that is what we have depicted. We know that the industry's general tolerance hovers around the eight story mark. And this is because where uh, the eight stories happens, it's kind of the tipping point where surface parking starts to move into structures and free up at grade space for other things such as parks and beautiful streetscapes. So these elements are really important um, to remember as, um, as we move along. And I think it's important to think about these other, these other benefits, the public spaces and the public streets, in addition to the buildings themselves, as they add to, uh, in combination, as they add to the vitality and character and ultimately the success of the downtown. On the next several slides, um, we want to share some three-dimensional images of what's emerged, what the emerging vision could look like um, as I've described in all of the plans. So on this first one here, the buildings um, on the municipal, pro municipal properties are shown in orange and all the other buildings outside of the municipally owned properties are shown in yellow. Uh, the existing buildings, or some of them, are highlighted in the gray. Uh, this view is taken from the southwest, and it clearly shows a transition of two- and three-story residential buildings uh, east and west of Toronto Street to uh, a form that is four- and six stories in a mixed-use form uh, focused along primarily Toronto Street. And so the red color as well is highlighting the ground floor where non-residential uses, retail, commercial, are accounted for, including along the existing main street. Uh, this next view is taken from the southeast and gives you a very clear view of the new public space, public square that has a very strong presence and visibility along the primary street frontage being Toronto Street. Uh, what this is also showing uh, you is that while the physical edge of the square may be Toronto Street, the buildings on the east side of the street also play a very important role in framing and defining that space, especially given that we're promoting um, a, a humanization of Toronto Street in this vicinity. Uh, this last and third view is taken from the west and shows the strong, the very strong, very clear east-west connection that is being promoted that extends uh, all the way from Isla Street in the foreground to King Edward Park in the background. And it's showing that as a landscape pedestrian link framed by buildings that open onto it. In terms of the urban square itself, some of the feedback that we received related to its location and size, and I wanted to um, provide some further information on that. So there was a suggestion that it be moved in board um, to the site. And there was another suggestion that perhaps the urban square that we're showing is a little bit too small. So when we tested these things out, um, this is what we discovered. So one of the things that urban designers um, always- oh, Sorry, uh, sorry, there you go fall back upon is that we know that public spaces um, are always more successful when they have visual prominence and presence along public streets. And so if we were to shift it west into the back, uh, back of the site or the west part of the site, uh, one of its, pro it would lose that frontage and um, visual prominence. As well, one of its primary, uh, I guess, framing buildings would then be the backside of the shops on Main Street, not the most attractive nor desirable condition to animate this new public space. So, and then the stats on the right-hand side uh, give you a little bit of uh, the numerical quantification of what the space um, uh, is representing. So it's about 1300 square meters in size. It has 55 meters of street frontage on Toronto Street. So the, the newly imagined Toronto Street. So not frontage on a highway condition, but frontage on a beautiful pedestrian scale streetscape. And then if we were to look at that size and, you know, guesstimate <clears throat> um, how many people it could accommodate for gathering and just informal activities. We're looking at about 130 to 250 persons, either seated or standing. In this scenario, we're showing uh, a combination of hard paved space, like a plaza that um, relates to the, to the active uses on the, for the buildings surrounding it. So spill out areas for patios and chairs and seating. 
and uh, events and gatherings. And then we're also showing that part of this urban square would be um, green. It would be soft, softscaped with trees and um, you know, a very traditional lawn that you can just sort of hang out on. Um, what, what we're also showing here is that the southern edge of this urban space it continues to be an access off of Toronto Street to the building behind. Um, so cars um, can access all the rear, rear sides of the buildings, but it's designed as a one earth condition. So the pavement um, that is identified for the square extends all the way south to the face of that new future building so that it looks seamless and it feels like one plaza that continues to allow vehicular access. Um, for reference, I just wanted to point out in terms of the size, there was mention that the, that the park, this new urban square uh, is too small. Uh, what we did was we looked at some other sites um, that some of you might be familiar with. So uh, to start off with the existing corner site where the temporary public space park uh, is located, it's about three times smaller than what we're proposing here. Um, as well, uh, when we look at other places like uh, Kitchener City Hall, as well as Waterloo Square on King Street, which is the main commercial street in downtown Waterloo, um, this, this, this urban square is quite similar in size to those two spaces, just in terms of its size. And then uh, the other thing is that it's actually larger uh, than one of these spaces that um, you know, urban designers love to reference as a beautiful, successful space in a downtown commercial core. And that's the one in Oakville, which only measures in comparison, a thousand square meters. So pic the picture on the upper left corner um, shows you what that space looks like in Oakville. And then uh, lastly, on the next several pages, slides, um, these are the renderings um, that we had showed in the first workshop, the first one being a view from the intersection, looking at the corner uh, and imagining what that would look like in this ultimate vision with a new building that anchors or a new landmark building that anchors the corner and then that public space beyond and then framed by an, another building to the north. A uh, view from Toronto Street looking at the existing parking lot and then what it could be once reimagined as a pedestrian muse that connects the buildings and um, creates that mid-block connection. That's fine, you can go, you can go next one. And this is a new image that um, we've added and it really deals with the, with the conversation we had last about the Woo and Earth along the south side of the Fire and Ice Hotel and reimagining it as a Woo and Earth that would allow vehicular access or ultimately as a complete uh, entirely pedestrian space with special paving, spill out area and landscape landscaping. Uh, so I'm gonna come back to this in just a minute, but just to wrap up the other work that the uh, municipality is doing by in. Mm -hmm. um, so while the visioning exercise is focused on the possibilities for the downtown, the municipality is also undertaking other work that may be informed by some of these outcomes. So for instance, under the official, pa uh, official plan, the municipality, which is going uh, with it, which is going through a review right now, the municipality may choose to enhance their existing uh, policies for urban design guidelines, urban uh, centers, as well as a downtown with language to address the desired character, form, scale, aesthetics of the downtown. So that might be added to the official plan, depending on what comes out of this final report. And then similarly, any updates to the provisions within the zoning bylaw, which is also going through a review currently, uh, could provide another level of specificity to development form and scale in the downtown that will help to achieve the desired character and aesthetics. And so one of the things I wanted to point out in the current zoning bylaw um, is that there's an institutional use on um, the hospital site and we're in this scenario reimagining uh, that those lands to be um, transformed into a, a residential use. So that's something um, that will probably uh, be looked at in that, in that work. So there's lots of things going on uh, outside of this vision that will that complement um, and support what is happening here. And then just in terms of our next steps, and then I'm going to open it up for a conversation. We are aiming for a council presentation on the 21st. We are starting to prepare a report that summarizes the process, the plan, uh, key guidelines, and it is to direct a request for interest from the private sector to think about redeveloping 
these properties. So this is not, uh, we're not doing anything sneaky or underhanded. This is absolutely the intent of the exercise to figure out the developability of this property. Uh, all information is going to be posted to the project webpage like we always have done. And then any comments that you have can be shared directly to the ECDEV at greyhighlands.ca. Um, I'm going to leave this image up on the screen for us to reference for questions of clarification or comments that you have. And I'm going to go down through my list. I'm going to make sure I give everyone on the call an opportunity to turn your mic on and share any thoughts, comments that you have on the plan. I'm going to go down through my list as I have you organized. And I'm going to, I'm not going to be calling on members of our steering committee or staff or counselors who are here to listen. They were here at the previous session as well. Um, so first on my list, I have Chris. And if you don't want to share in thoughts, I just will assume I'll watch out for mics turning on. And if they don't turn on, I'll go on. And then next on my list is Heather. And then after Heather, I have John. So Heather, I'll keep an eye out for your mic coming on. There you go, Heather, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking at this and it's absolutely gorgeous. And then I transpose myself to the corner of Toronto and Maine. Yeah. And the trucks going through and where are you going to get this width, this beautiful green sidewalks and everything. We're yeah. off. So Yin, do you want to just comment yeah. on, so what we're looking at, so for everybody on the, so Toronto is right where my cursor is, Maine here. So what Yin's showing is, I'm just going to trace some stuff so the curb comes out mm -hmm. a little bit, there's trees planted, there's on-street parking, so still the travel lanes are maintained. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, I okay. think one of the things that's really deceiving is that when you're out there, it feels incredibly wide because it's all paved. But when I underlay, so when I look at the plan and I measure it out, the travel lanes where the trucks and the, and the cars, where they currently move through, that's not being changed. The only thing that's being changed or suggested to change is that where there's lay-by parking currently permitted, that we're, I guess, formalizing it by or protecting it by bringing out the curb as bump outs. So the travel portions are not changing. I think where we're taking that space or gaining that space is really within um, the on-street parking and the shoulders that are currently there that are paved. And I think it's um, it's really a funny little thing that happens because the perception it is it's quite wide, but really it's um that that portion that travel portion isn't changing. Okay, like an illusion almost. But yes, it's the space is there. We just have to reallocate it um, somehow. Yeah, okay. Single lane. <laughs> <laughs> there will still be, yeah, still a lane in each direction for sure, and still mm -hmm. enabling trucks to go through. Anything else from your perspective, Heather? Uh, no, that, that was okay. the main. Yep. Okay. Yeah, thank you. We'll, 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 we'll probably have a chance to come back and just do one more cycle through too. So next I had up was John. And then Kathy. And then Marty. And then Nadia. There. Hi, Nadia, go ahead. Um, Hi. Um, so, so this like the the building blocks of this looks really good. Um, it all seems very reasonable, and I'm um, really like all that green space. Um, so, so that's all looking very, very good. So, I think these comments. So, two kind of comments. Okay. Um, just sort of maybe they're just more sort of kind of side comments, or maybe as we're going forward. But it would be really great to have kind of inspirational um, kind of a vision about you know, green, uh, like, mm -hmm. you know, green buildings or, or, you know, sort of when we think about sort of the 
how we actually start to execute upon this. Yeah. Um, so yeah. just having high standards towards, you know, um, you know, towards um, green, green standards. What, and what that means, um, that is, yeah, that is a really good idea. Okay, keep going. Because, you know- Can I speak to that? Sorry, can I? Yeah, sorry, I was just going to let Nadia finish that, okay. finish your thoughts. So that the, what I'm hearing so far, really high standards, inspirational images that depict what you have in your mind and municipality too, probably what a green building might look like. But finish that thought then. Yeah, because yeah, because I think, you know, there is one thing, you know, but, you know, sort of using landscaping and, um, and also just like green standards in terms of building materials, etc. Um, you yeah. know, incorporating, you know, um, like say like a green roof or, you know, et cetera. So yeah. just being really inspirational because I think, you know, when you're, this is such a great opportunity um, yeah. in terms of almost like, you know, kind of revitalizing, um, yeah. you know, a, a small town. So yeah. I think we can really stand out as being yeah. sort of a poster child um, oh, yeah. for that. Okay. So, so I think that's, so I think there's yeah. a really great opportunity to shine a huge spotlight on Markdale. Okay. And then the other thought, oh, sorry, if I think- Do you want, do you want to, do you want to weigh in, why in? No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead, please. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, okay, you finish, finish and then your just the other. Yeah, then just the, another comment is, um, so I, I, I really appreciate the, um, the process mm -hmm. and how, um, we are you are gaining a lot of really um good input you know from mm -hmm. stakeholders and the community etc just wondering just this is just a thought um you know i think our young folk yeah um, could be participating in this and i'm thinking like you know grade school middle school high school um you know because i think you know you could find gems in terms of you know what they're thinking about yeah, um, yeah. and they are you know because they are an important part Yep. Know, of our community thread yeah um and you know instead of you know adults thinking about you know what kids may want it would be yes. really great to kind of get their input directly uh, yeah that's a great that is a great suggestion and you know uh, nadia for some other projects we uh, sometimes do a call out to people on our steering committees or counselors to identify a handful of youth that we could have a Zoom call with, a focused conversation with people that are under 16 years old and it's, it, it, it can be really insightful. So that is a great suggestion. And we will take that up with our, um, our great steering committee and staff team. Wai Ying, you were gonna going to respond to I think Nadia's comment on green buildings or green yeah, buildings. Yeah, and standards. sorry, Nadia, for interrupting. I just got excited when you said the green stuff. <laughs> so all I was going to say was that um, on that last slide, when I said that the the municipality is going through their official plan review, that is like the perfect opportunity to embed some of those principles in the yeah. official plan. So a green community, and I know that the municipality has a vision. Um, a vision in their in their uh, official plan that's being reviewed right now, but there's um, definitely opportunity to um, make that more robust with that type of language and direction. So that's that would be an appropriate place for for that. Okay, thanks, Nadia. Um, next up on my list, I have Nancy. I'm there here. You go. There you go, Nancy. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I have two or two or three things, and for anyone on the call that doesn't know, I'm the chair of the, the Heritage Committee. And because the fire hall is designated by the Planning Act and by the Ontario Heritage Act, there are certain considerations that have to be taken into account with adjacent buildings. And you know, that's not my idea pushing in. That's that's provincial policy and provincial um, you know, um, legislation. Yeah. Uh, so one of my concerns, um, my first question is, what I'm looking at seems to imply that the TD, existing TD bank is going to be torn down. Is that correct? So let's get why in. Do you want to? Want to put up the, um, the, uh, the 3D massing? Yeah. So in the model, so the quick the quick answer, Nancy, is no. We're not recommending that the bank be torn down. Uh, we are recommending that 
the site be redeveloped and there is consideration for integrating, incorporating the existing heritage building into whatever form that 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 corner eventually takes. So whether it's, you know, partially, I know that, you know, some some um, staunch uh, heritage uh, planners and architects don't really like the facadism that's going on, but I mean, that's always an option. Um, and so for, between, you know, just the facade and the full building and um, uh, retrofitting it for a different use, there's a whole, there's a whole range of things that could happen to, to maintain that, that but, structure. Yeah, so the short answer that we are not and assuming that the TD building is torn down. So I, I go to the Ontario Heritage Conference every year. I deal with heritage yeah. planners and architects regularly because I'm also on the Board of Community Heritage Ontario. Um, if you're talking about a green policy, um, adaptive reuse, and I was so glad to hear her say that, adaptive mm -hmm. reuse is a really important thing in, in the heritage community right now. And the thing to remember, that building, that TD building was built, I believe, something like 1906, 1907. Mm -hmm. It is built of the most incredibly unusual double bond brick I have ever seen. And I'm, I'm a bit of, become a brick expert since I took over this job. Um, and so incorporating the whole building and reusing, the other thing they say, like 20% 20, 20 of all landfill in Ontario is from demolition, demolition waste. And that building in a lot of ways, because it is solid double brick, is already a green building and it, it, it would lend itself beautifully. And, and it is a landmark as well. Mm -hmm. It's not designated or anything, but it is beside the fire hall and the two mm -hmm. of them look really nice together. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so I would really I would really urge um, not just the planning team, but also the council people that are listening to really consider s preserving that as, as part of our heritage made to be appearance. It's been part of the Four Corners for over a hundred years. So let's okay. keep it part of the Four Corners. Okay. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, somebody else addressed, I was worried about the sidewalks being too narrow, but when you said get rid of the on-street parking on Highway 10, that solves that. Some of it, some of it. All of yeah. it. The, the buildings that you showed, and, and I just want to verify, that's not so. That's not really what you're, you, I, I wouldn't like to see any of those buildings in downtown Markdale because none of them would flatter the existing heritage buildings that are in Markdale on Main Street and, and on um, Toronto Street South. Uh, you know, so what I really did, like the, the sketch that was shown at, that Darren Patey submitted, something like that, if the buildings look like that, I mean, I would be doing handstands in the public park. <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah, we, are, we, aren't, we aren't showing um, architecture intentionally. We're not showing building design. We're just showing building footprints, where buildings could be located and how mm -hmm. they could be disposed uh, uh, located on the municipally owned property. So, so we're not so doing anything to talk about the, the style of the building right now, but I understand um, the preference that you're expressing of that style that was shown on the Facebook yeah, yeah. Uh, concepts. Well, and, and, yep. and, you know, and that that's, I mean, I do understand, I have a background in architecture and I, I do understand you were showing massing and size yeah. and that kind yeah. of stuff. Um, yeah. I just got two more quick. The one point about the fire hall, when you started saying six and eight story buildings, one of the fire hall's designated attributes is that it is a landmark visible as you approach Markdale in all four directions. And so that that needs to sort of be maintained. And I don't see yeah. any problem with that, with anything that's going on on the west side of Toronto Street. But I think you have to be careful with what goes on in the PD corner on the e okay yeah. okay yeah. yeah and and i just yeah. i want to give a shout out to the last person that spoke because green roofs with gardens on them and all that sort of stuff that is a fabulous idea and they've proven it, it doesn't just it doesn't just start out being good you reduce all your need for air conditioning your need yeah. for heating and yeah. you know you've got a place to grow vegetables and you know it can be a community garden for the apartment people so there's just an mm -hmm. awful lot of good stuff about that i'm going to get up okay I know okay talk, but thank you for that letting is me have great okay thank Thanks, you nancy Nancy. that's great um 
Well, those are some great thoughts. Uh, Roy, you're next up and then I have Stuart. So you go ahead, Roy. Okay. Um, I was listening to the uh, session that occurred earlier today. Yep. And uh, quite a bit of discussion about parking. Yep. And uh, the amount of parking needed. Um, what's going through my mind now is my experience driving into Markdale and parking in the winter time, basically the, with the, uh, after a storm, there's many days when the amount of parking available is significantly reduced. Mm -hmm. um, and as the driver gets out of the car and tries to get to the sidewalk, oh, no. they can there's... be walking between yeah. uh, four and 18 inches of slush sometimes. Yes, yes. So yes. Um, the idea of a pedestrian friendly community is ideal. Yeah. But I do think we need to think to some degree about four seasons. Yeah. And I don't hear anything about that at this point. Yeah. I mean, what you're talking about are the uh, about challenges of uh, parking in the winter when you're navigating piles of snow and slush is, is something absolutely that we've had to grapple with in many of our downtown um, studies. And, and here's just a story from Huntsville where the mayor in Huntsville, who used to be a developer. And when he stopped being a developer, he was the mayor for a couple of terms in Huntsville. And he decided for the three blocks in downtown Huntsville, that as soon as it snowed, all the snow and slush would be cleared from the curb and from the parking lane and disposed of outside of the three block area of downtown. And he was going to be treating downtown Huntsville like the big plazas on the outskirts of Huntsville. Mm -hmm. And so they made it a priority to clear that stuff away so that people didn't have to scramble over banks of snow after they parked their car trying to get to the sidewalk and other side. So that's one way of thinking, you know, making suggestions operationally about thinking four seasons. But I know why Ying in, in thinking about the square, the urban square, you're already thinking about it being used in every season. Mm -hmm. Well, ideally, I, ideally, yes. Um, I mean, you know, some of the challenges with the weather, um, you know, can't, can't entirely be solved with the design, but definitely a combination of design and maintenance and operations for sure. And, and definitely a commitment from the municipality to, to maintain that. Um, I think they all work together. I think it's a really tricky challenge to balance all of those things. Um, but I do believe that in this reimagined environment or physical environment of the downtown, it would seem to me that with all of this, the new stuff that's being introduced, that there would be a um, related commitment to maintain it, maintaining yeah. it. Yeah. So they go hand in hand. Let's see. Was there anything else from your perspective, Roy? Um, I'll think. I'll, I think I'll leave it at that. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, Stuart. Hi. There you go, Stuart. Yep, go ahead. Uh, okay, so, I mean, I've been at both sessions and uh, I've yeah. learned a lot and like I think you have as well. Yes, uh, we have. And uh, I, I'm liking what I'm hearing. Um, I do feel that uh, the downtown square concept that uh, that Darren Patey brought forth is something worth considering. Uh, and because uh, you could make uh, some very interesting uh, uh, concepts at the corner there. And we also, as, uh, as the Chamber of Commerce, we do have some money that we'd like to put an FT Hill Memorial there yeah. at, at the corner if possible, okay? Yeah. So uh, Darren has some designs that he may, he may post to Facebook. Uh, it, it doesn't, yeah. you know, it, it, I think everybody agrees that we need something downtown, at yeah. a gathering place, where it, whether yeah. it's there or up there, doesn't really matter yet. Uh, will condos uh, be built or versus rental apartments? All those things need to be, you know, evolved. Yeah. I think I think we all agree on certain, the th you know, the three th the three principles. I don't like to see buildings too close to the 
to the roadway. I'm, I'm not sure how wide the current sidewalk is, but let's say it's on, on, on Toronto Street North. Maybe mm -hmm. it's six feet. Um, I, I would like, I think the sidewalk on Main Street is twice that size. So I'd like to at least see uh, a 12 foot or, you know, sidewalk where you can have outdoor cafes, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, okay. Whether they're back on the plaza. I don't like, I don't like to creep uh, the buildings right out onto the, uh, it, it gives me claustrophobia. Right, the curb. Yeah. What, what and you... it's a tunnel effect. Um, yeah. I, I do like what Nadia said. I think that's a, a given that we explore, you know, explore green roofs. We, the municipality, we talked about that for years. So it's a matter of, uh, you know, making sure that a developer coming into town and it would be an exciting time for a developer to look at the town because there's so many yeah. things that are happening. Yes, uh, for sure. That would, that, you know, whether it be uh, terrace gardens, et cetera. I know my, as I mentioned before, my son lives in a condo in, in Waterloo that has uh, terraces, terrace uh, balconies up to the sixth floor and then it narrows in and goes up. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. on, uh, on the sixth floor is a, a nice swimming pool as well. So, I mean, all those things are all possible. Okay. Uh, it's, I just, I have an open mind right now. And, uh, and again, I just reiterate that the community center at, at the Markdale Center needs to be included because if you're going to have people living downtown, they got to have a place to have recreation as well. So yeah. but if I move there, I would want to have it either in the building or closely accessible. Okay, so Waiying, let me just get, I just wanna get your measurements. So let me just get like the width of the um, side from the curb to the building face, like right here where I put my yellow. I'm going to give you some numbers, but don't quote me on it, okay? Um, so for the boulevards, from the, the, the curb back to the boulevard, I have accounted for about three meters so that so we can get like the trees, nine. soil volumes in there. And so the that's trees. nine feet. Okay, yeah, nine, nine, for nine the plus boulevard, feet, yeah. How much? Of so sidewalk. for the sidewalks, I'm showing, I believe it's 2.4, which is eight, eight feet for, the, for the sidewalk and then, and then the building. So, Generally. I mean, it depends how you want to work it, but let's face it, if we, if yeah. we want outdoor cafes and things, we're mm -hmm. not going to do it on eight feet. Uh, so whether you move at under the eaves of the, of the lower level of the building, et cetera, mm -hmm. it could all be incorporated. But if you want to get that, that buzz in downtown, you're going to have yeah. to, you're going to have to accommodate it. That, right. Right. Uh, but that's up to a developer to, to look yeah. at that. If developers would. Well, I think we can also embed some of that, um, some of that into the zoning bylaw, right? Like when I talked about setbacks on the existing main street, I mean, I think I was also kind of lumping this whole conversation together, which is if we, can where we have existing very tight sidewalks if we can push the building new buildings back a little bit just to you know carve out a bit more space that would well, be I, more, I, I do think. believe that that's that's something that yeah. it would be important to for the mm -hmm. to create the downtown atmosphere that you'd like to see all right yeah and and where i just circled in yellow i mean that's an ideal location too to have outdoor patio tables, cafe tables on the park, like well back from the street. So there's I, I don't disagree that that's possible. Uh, lots of options. I do want to come back uh, just because I know we heard this at the first session too about the option of a, I'm just going to circle it so everybody knows where we're talking, about extending the green space down here. And it's really interesting that we've had that conversation. I know Darren has got that on his uh, Facebook page in Waiying will remember that we absolutely explored that as one of our initial options that we were tossing around and sharing with well, our steering committee. Yeah. And, and so just I just want Waiying just to weigh in because we, we seriously considered green and we had great conversations with our steering committee. Okay. Okay. Um, so Waiying, just for the people that are on this call, why we chose to chose building over green at the corner? Mm, um, I think it's always a challenge because it's always building or green, right? Um, and I think we're trying to achieve a multitude of objectives um, with all the different pieces of this plan. So here I can specifically say that I think some of the thinking that went into this was, um, you know, the, the desire to create a building landmark in a prominent location um, consideration for the side of that existing building not being 
and no offense to the owner of that building either, uh, the side of that building that's exposed not being sort of an ideal active edge was a right. consideration. Uh, the other thing globally that we were trying to do with this plan was that Toronto Street, as we all know, feels like a highway, looks like a highway, functions as a highway, sort of. And the whole point was to try to take all of that expansive paved area and try to bring it down into a human scale. So how do we do that? The tools within an urban designer's toolbox include um, creating a street wall to kind of bring that down in the vertical sense. Um, providing the street, like the streetscape enhancements, narrowing the perception of the traveled lanes of the of the roadway where the cars are actually functioning, um, and that's a perception thing. It has nothing to do with making those lanes uh, narrower. So all of those things, when we bring them together, are uh, in our minds intended to humanize this stretch of Toronto Street, um, provide a landmark in that very prominent location that says, "Hey." Um, this is downtown Markdale. I think tend to, and this is me, maybe personally, I tend to think that um, when we have these parks that are meant to be little oases in downtowns and, you know, people kind of pause, they gather, they meet, they chat. I always feel that I don't like to be exposed to a street. And I've heard this from other people too. I don't like to be exposed as uh, to, the, to the traffic, let's say. A little bit is good. But when you feel like you have two street frontages with cars zipping by, it feels a little bit um, less pedestrian. It feels faster as a faster space than a slower space. And we're trying to create that slow, that slow space by tacking it just behind that building. And then in doing so, we're able to develop a really uh, fantastic building on the corner and hopefully you know, through even an architectural competition, uh, design something that's a landmark that does um, pay homage to what was there before. Yeah, and it's funny because everybody talks about that corner with respect to the FT Hill building. The so the building contributed that marking the identity of this four corner it wasn't wasn't an open space that contributed to the identity of downtown. Well, there wasn't. A, if the, if I may interrupt, and, and I understand completely what you're saying. I don't disagree with with your analysis. Uh, uh, of that corner. In fact, there was a there was a building that was designed many years ago before we even bought that land by Andrew Marchenko, which moved the building right out to the corner. So I mean, you've probably seen that design. It was posted to Facebook as well through the chamber. But uh, so I don't have I don't have I don't have a problem. It's just you know, are we locked in? I mean, if a developer came and said I wanted to do something, are we flexible in our thinking? That's all because okay. either either could work. Um, mm -hmm. The old okay. FT Hill build, building was there. I don't. I don't disagree. So, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just, are we locked in? Uh, there are some options that Darren will probably post as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Um, Tasha, you are last but not least on the list. <laughs> You're first to join the meeting. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. There you uh, go. Um, yeah, again, I just want to say that the basic concepts of connectivity and greenness and so forth, you guys totally get it, and I'm really happy about that. Um, I just have two comments. One regarding the fire hall that I think yeah. uh, Nancy referred to as well. Mm -hmm. um, in the, in the three-dimensional um, diagram, it seems to me that the poor old fire hall is really dwarfed it's and actually dwarfed. physically shadowed from the south by a okay. six story building. Okay. So um, we'll I don't know whether, that. We'll you know, maybe that particular that. one. Should... Oh yeah, sure. Okay, I think um, that's Anyway, I'm just point. thinking that maybe on that corner, the building should be limited. Um, so it's not dwarfing the fire hall yeah. or, or so much shadowing it because that, that mm -hmm. higher building would be to the south. Um, and, and secondarily with the, with the fire hall, I was wondering if uh, that building structure and or the municipal bylaws would allow a rooftop patio, because I know that, that um, this is a new term to me, this woonerf. <laughs> yes, um, yes, yes, we did not obviously we didn't not define that. that. We should have <laughs> defined that. Yes. Yeah, um, if, if, there, if there is that passageway for traffic as well, um, then the, the, the 
patio space, the outdoor seating spacing, which we've all learned is very important in times like these. Yes, yes. Um, if, if there's any possibility for some of that being moved upstairs onto the roof. Okay, I, I'm not, I don't have an answer for that. Why, Ying, do you know? But we can, we can find out before um, we... Uh, I definitely do don't know. I'm sorry. But we yeah. can find out. We, we'll check in with our, um, our uh, staff team yeah. and see what okay. we can find out. Okay. Thanks for that. Okay. Anything else from your? Um, yeah, the only the only other thing regarding accommodation again. Yeah, kudos for for getting the message that having people living downtown in a diversity of accommodation options is really important. I think, um, but the one thing I haven't heard mentioned is that Markdale is the community on the edge of Beaver Valley, like yes. number one recreation space in this yes. part of the county. And, um, and whether there's sufficient hotel or, you know, yeah. like very short term accommodation available in in this plan anywhere. Yeah, the, good point. And somebody in the previous session asked about that as well with the with the orange buildings that are on the screen or the brown ones, could they be accommodation why you do you want to yeah and i'm sorry donna you did ask me and told me not to forget to mention it and yet i forgot to mention <laughs> it <laughs> so they yes could absolutely they could all of the all of the buildings that you're seeing on the plan can accommodate um a hotel like function i would say i would say like having thought about this a little bit more since our last session that the um that the residential type buildings that you see on the left and right hand sides of the screen so the east and west extremity of main street are kind of ideal locations for Oops, their sorry i don't mean to do that yeah where yeah. this could occur because they're not necessarily really active uses but they do provide a wonderful transition from your residential neighborhoods to the the true commercial retail downtown core so those two yeah blocks. and i think i think it's just such a perfect use we can all think of the small towns and villages that we've visited and stayed in a small inn right in the middle of the village and it's such a beautiful experience so I think it's a great a great suggestion okay mm -hmm. good thank, thank you Tasha thanks so Otherwise, much thank yeah again kudos <laughs> that it's really good to see this kind of forward thinking and with all the good design features that I would like to see Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. that. Thanks Thank for you very reminding much. me. Okay. Uh, Donna, could I, I mean, it's Nancy Matthews again. Yep, there you go, Nancy. Yep. I have a question for Tasha because I happen to know what's designated and what's not designated on the fire hall. When she talks about a raised cafe, which I think, or a raised um, outdoor cafe, which I think is a dynamite idea. A rooftop. She's talking specifically about a rooftop patio. Yeah, uh, at the fire on hall. The fire yeah. hall, or on the building to the south of it. That's what Ta I. Oh. Tasha, do you want to just flip your? Yeah, uh, yeah, Nancy. I uh, the idea came to me when I was sitting waiting for my dog in the vet parking lot, <laughs> and looking <laughs> looking at the bare roof of the fire hall. Um, shortly after this, the first visioning session for this, and I know uh, I believe mm. one of the owners was 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 there and was talking about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, she was there. the space confinement yeah the, the confined space between uh for for a, a drivable laneway between the fire hall and the building to the south um and okay, i sit there looking at it and then thinking well it would be great if you just moved the patio up onto up the roof top. <laughs> um, and, but, and i i can i can address that in a positive way um the south part of the fire hall which has the old or the addition to the fire hall mm -hmm. none of the features of it are designated okay. uh, now the, the entire original building the tower the bell tower the bell itself all of that is designated and um so uh, when chris did his renovations we were with him that was all allowable the only a little bit of a concern i would have with putting that a, a, patio up there is that the the present time the current um the current use for the second floor of the fire hall is uh, a, an apartment and the windows look out on that patio so uh, you wouldn't want oh. your apartment windows oh yeah however having having said that what you could do that could maybe resolve it all the way around if you want that to be a walkthrough, 
why couldn't it be a covered walkthrough, like a carport kind of a thing, mm -hmm. uh, just that a tr something like a trellis, so the garden could be up there, there could be a plant buffer between the edge, it could spill over onto part of the existing roof, you'd have to put probably some kind of wheelchair accessibility from inside the fire hall, but it could spill over and there could be a green buffer like some plantation and stuff that would protect the privacy of the people in the apartment. Mm -hmm. And that could be like a triple win for everybody and you wouldn't have to clear snow off that pathway um, in the winter <laughs> as much. <laughs> and maybe in sometime in the future, there will be other housing options. So the owners of Fire and Ice wouldn't have to provide an apartment for workers or for whoever. There'd be lots of other housing options in downtown Markdale. Because we have heard right now, from them. It's not, for, not for workers, it's just it's a rental apartment, mm -hmm. downtown accommodation that's been, I believe, very successful for the people yeah. that are enjoying it. Yeah, for sure. And and also because there aren't a lot of other choices is the point that I'm just trying to make. And so if there were other choices, the pressure might come off um, mm -hmm. individuals providing that. There might be other choices for where to live. And okay. increased demand for other uses. Yes, part of yeah, that, right? So, yes, sorry, yeah. yeah, that's where I'm going with that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have anything else they want to share? It's just coming up on 5.30, I'm happy to stay on quick uh, question anybody else yep go ahead Stuart yep that's you and then Roy I think you have your mic on the, too. go uh, ahead Stuart the, the county um, <clears throat> is as a consultant that's been hired to evaluate uh, uh, the future of Gray Gables and they're also going to build a 128 bed uh, long-term care at the back of the current Gray Gables so what do you do with the, with the current Gray Gables? Do you, you repurpose it, do you, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera. So there's some, there's some flexibility and may, maybe some great potential there. Perhaps yeah. that consultant you should be talking to just to see what their, their take is because they okay. mentioned a lot of different things that could be happening there at, at okay. Gray Gables. Uh, so that's, that's, that's uh, certainly something else that uh, needs to be looked at is and the 128 bed uh you know facility as well will also change the dynamics and that brought up a discussion at the county that possibility that hotels are needed for for people that are uh, you know visiting people mm -hmm. that are in long-term care visiting people that are in the hospital so yeah. you know where this fits in this boutique hotel kind of concept we all yeah. know that it exists in europe but it's a, it could be unique in, in, in Markdale as well. So okay. you know, it's more important because of the things that are being said by the hospital and, and the long-term care. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Uh, Roy, you've got your mic on. Go ahead, Roy. Yes, uh, the discussion about the uh, building uh, that's on the drawings for at the, the Northwest corner. Yeah. Of, uh, of Toronto and Maine. Yeah, and yeah. It, it part of, that building comes up to where the uh, little park yeah. open space would be. Yeah. Um, if if there if there's if you wanted a building there, and I think at the last uh, session this uh, on one o'clock there was comment about not being able to see that from the corner, see the park. Yeah. Area. Yeah. Um, a building that has an open main floor, ground floor. So it actually would flow the whatever use it was put to mm -hmm. would yeah. flow from the, the green area yeah. to the area that is sheltered by the upper stories of the building. Yeah. I'm wondering if something like that can accomplish both both aspects of what people are talking about. Yeah. Okay. So, it could, making and, it open at the corner and and, and it's still providing some kind of building. Okay. To, okay. To find the corner. That's good. Um, That's great. Okay. Um, one thing that would go through my mind would be a farmer's market. Yeah. For example, or. Yeah. Uh, perhaps uh, some um, 
kind of public functions okay. that would work in weather that's uh, not suitable for the, uh, the open area. Okay. So just an okay. idea. Okay, thanks for that, Roy. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Before we bring to the meeting to a close, um, and I am just doing a quick scan. I'm not seeing anybody. So once again, this has been a really great conversation. I love that it's a, a manageable size. I love that we can try and have a back and forth conversation about ideas and responses and why we do what we did and room to move. I love all the, the things that we've talked about. We're going to be uh, doing a summary of what we heard in this session and the previous one, and we'll be uh, making some tweaks to what you're seeing when we present it to council to give a really full report out on everything we've learned so far. So I really appreciate that you've carved off a bit of time this afternoon and jumped on the call and keep an eye out on the webpage. Both recordings will be on there. Share it with your friends and family so that they can hear the presentation and you can have a conversation and then send any additional comments uh, to the ECDEV at greyhighlands.ca. Uh, so with that, I'm going to end the meeting on everybody's behalf and stop the recording. And, and thank you one more time for joining in.